Good morning and welcome to Business Morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwagu. Kick it off with commodities as oil prices eased slightly this morning, but held most of their gains from the previous session after U.S. government data showed a fall in inventories, supporting the view that fuel demand is returning despite the coronavirus pandemic. Brent crude was down eight cents at $45.35 a barrel after a gain of around 2% in the previous session. West Texas Intermediate oil was down by six cents at $42.61 a barrel after gaining 2.6 percent on Wednesday. U.S. crude oil, gasoline and distillate inventories fell last week as refiners ramped up production and demand improved. Data from the Energy Information Administration showed U.S. fuel demand rose to 19.37 million barrels per day last week, the highest since March, while crude output fell to 10.7 million barrels per day from 11 million barrels per day. Crude inventories fell by 4.5 million barrels compared with analyst expectations. The EIA's uh, downward revision on Tuesday to a key U.S. oil production forecast for this year also supported prices. U.S. crude production is forecast to fall by 990,000 barrels per day this year to 11.26 million barrels per day, steeper than the 600,000 barrels per day decline it forecast last month. Now, capping gains, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries said in a monthly report that world oil demand will fall by 9.06 million barrels per day this year, more than and the 8.95 million barrels per day decline expected a month ago. Analysts say increasing uncertainty over a stalemate in Washington on a stimulus package to support recovery from the deepest impact of the coronavirus pandemic may also weigh on prices. All right, let's take a moment now. We'll be back to drill down on the domestic commodities market. Well, price discrimination oftentimes is seen as an integral part of an imperfect market, and that cuts across commodities and foreign exchange. Nigeria has moved from an almost imperfect market with state monopolies to an imperfect market where we have few sellers and many buyers. And so, if you live in Lagos Island, Victoria Island, or Ikoi, there is tendency you may be paying more for the commodities purchased than someone living on the mainland, or channels television Business News in a joint survey with FDC research team took a trip to some Lagos markets to establish some discrimination in prices of some food commodities and the factors responsible for that. Our business correspondent Eddie Dong Ewan reports. Our first port of call is the popular Oingbo market on Lagos mainland. Oingbo Market is one of the major markets where trucks bring in food commodities of load and traders from smaller markets come to buy here. Oftentimes, a basket of tomatoes will cost about 25,000 naira in one market, and in another market, that same basket of tomatoes will go for about 30,000 naira. A price survey here at Oingbo Market and other markets will give a sense of how much these commodities cost and the reasons for the difference in prices. How much be a basket of tomatoes now? Uh, that big one, 15,000, that big one. Big one now, 15,000? Yes. The price, you go up or you come down? Yes, no, so tomato you go The price don't come down? Yes, don't come down. Yeah. Commodities such as beans goes for 19,000 naira a bag in Oingbo, while in Sura market it goes for 20,000 naira. A bunch of plantain in Oingbo goes for 1,200, while in Sura market you will get that same bunch at 2,500 naira. Interestingly, the price of rice in Oingbo market is the same with what you find in Sura market at 28,000 naira. 1,000, don't come down. Yes, don't come down. Okay. This is the season of new yam. We found out that yam in Oingbo market is more expensive than yam in Shura market. In Oingbo, a medium tuba of yam goes for a thousand naira, while in Shura market it is sold for seven hundred naira because there you will find more of the old yams. New one go come, everything go come down for this time around. This yam for now, now seven hundred naira. Location, or as some might say, the elitism of the neighborhood also plays a role in price determination. But with the emergence of technology, the variation of prices across markets are likely to reduce. It's getting better. Pandemic or no pandemic, the, with the emergence of mobile phones, if I want to buy a commodity, 
Uh, I, I, all I have to do is take a picture of it, send it to my cousin who is in Karanamoda or Abuja, and say, what's the price of this? And he says, okay, this thing is selling for that. So there's price discovery because of mobile phones. That gives you the perfect information angle. Um, the settlement of the transaction is another part that makes the price easier. Price discrimination, they say, is not Nigeria-specific, but a universal phenomenon. It is a natural function of higher logistics cost, demand elasticity, market segmentation, and income inequality. But in all of these, what matters to a consumer is to have an improved purchasing power. Edith Young Iwang, Channels Television News. All right, joining me now to explain further some of those findings there is one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company, Dubebi Iyeke. Good morning, Dubebi. Thank you for joining morning, us. Thank you. <laughs> well, I see you smiling there. Yes. You went on this survey with Edith Young. What were your major findings? Your caption says, Lagos retailers are mainly price sharks. How so? I mean, um, the main reason why we went for the survey in the first place um, was to establish um, price discrimination across various markets in Lagos State and you know we're using Lagos as a proxy for you know the entire country to show whether this um, economic phenomenon plays out you know in Nigeria markets be it open markets or supermarkets and to what degree or extent are consumers experiencing these price differences so um, we, we were able to do that and you know not only um, the price differences you know, coming up, but are we seeing it to the form or to the extent of price gorging? So um, we're able to, so that was what um, guided, guided our mindset towards this, um, towards this survey. And, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're able to establish these facts and, you know, give um, our inference. So some of the various things that we found were, you know, peculiarities and differences between various open markets, various supermarkets, and the differences or price differences between open markets and supermarkets. So between um, the open markets themselves, we were able to find that, number one, these markets specialize in perishables and, you know, major staples like rice, yam, you know, and these, these are the major commodities that they um, specialize in. And we found that markets that are within, open markets that are within the um, that have close proximity have relatively stable prices. Their prices are relatively the same um, with just slight differences when we look at the price difference between um, a market like Oingbo and Edo. So they're, they're quite close. So the price differences in certain commodities are not so wide. And then when we look at the commodity, we also look at um, the location of these commodities. So we look at the location of this um, location of this market. So this market, a market like in Surai, is situated around VI, the environs, you have it around them, the VI environs, the Ikoye environs. So we see that because of this location, their prices are relatively higher and compared to a market like Oingbo that's situated around Yaba, you have um, Yaba environs in Butemeta. And then we also look at, um, interestingly, the retailer's perception. Mm. So the retailer's look at the consumers and they size them up, you know, before they give <laughs> yeah, them the price. Yeah, so it's kind of thing. E exactly. Yeah. So if you're coming in, you know, for example, while we we're doing the survey, I'm really light skinned. So, <laughs> so going to the market, you know, people were already saying they were already hiking the price. Absolutely. A colleague of mine had to say, you and know what? And then when they see the kind of the color, color you're coming. You're coming into their, they're like, you know what? Just move, move away. <laughs> Let's get the real prices because these people are really sizing you up and, you know, they are giving us outrageous prices. But, mm. you know, by the time you get to meet them and then you, you have this conversation with them, you understand that um, they really do that. So they have a perception of the consumer that is coming and then they also give their price with that in mind. So you have you have Sura um, retailers also do the same. Imagine the consumer coming in with their Jeep and then, you know, they, they size. So you have mm. those differences across open markets. Then when you look at the supermarkets, we're able to find that location was also a big deal because um, these um, markets are you know, they, they pay rent, their rent is quite high. So when you look at a supermarket in a supermarket on the mainland, a supermarket on the on the island, their prices also vary. And we found that the variations in price differences between open markets and supermarkets in 
on the island and the mainland are almost of the same degree. So you have um, Sura, um, um, the open market in Sura and Oingbo market, the price difference is about 15%. And then you find that the, the supermarket in um, probably Lekki and you know, in Magodo, you're having the price difference almost that same range. So um, those are some of the things that we found across you know, both the open market and the now, supermarket. Now, I'm sure you listened to that report uh, yes, you put yes. together there. Yes. I, I find it interesting that, um, yeah, sold in Sura market happens to be um, less expensive mm -hmm. than that uh, sold in Uyumbo. Why? I mean, um, first off, this is yams. Yam is in season now because new yam is coming out. So the price of the old yam is really going down. Um, for the um, woman in Sura market, if we were able to find that she has more of old yams. So, okay. oh, and the price of old yams now are relatively cheaper than, are re relatively cheaper. And then we also realized that the size of our yams are smaller. So you have in, um, in uh, um, Oingbo market, they are, they are, what, what they would show as a medium sized yam is a little bit bigger than what it is in oh. Sura market. And so that was one of, those were some of the differences that, that we found as to why her prices were the way um, they, they are. And um, another thing that we were able to find across this market um, are that people from, um, retailers from Sura market, you know, they purchase from other commodity specific markets like Oingbo. Okay, so perhaps that's the reason for yes, the for price, the price very Yes, for the price. So yes. that's, you know, that's another major reason for um, the price. So these are some of the things that we observe because they, they, um, they have their transport costs to look at, they have their carrying costs to look at, and you know, they're also paying, their rent is relatively So traders know, more in, in Sura go, they go to um, Oyibo to purchase like their Oyibo commodities? In, exactly, and then take it to, the, um, take it to the, um, the Sura market to sell to consumers. So they have their retailers margin there. So where you have like Oyibo market is selling at a wholesale price, Sura market um, retailers, um, um, traders will be selling at a retail price. Okay. Now, s sometimes these traders are charged kind of taxes or fares. Do they complain any, you know, about any yeah, such we thing? Yeah, we got quite a few from um, some of our interviewees and um, they expressed concerns, uh, expressed concerns explicitly in that particular um, area. And, you know, this is compounding the fact that they are already paying more for transportation. Mm. Normally, if they're bringing a good or a commodity into Lagos State, they already have, they're already incurring costs because now they're paying for each bag of, for example, a trader bringing in um, bags of beans into mm. Lagos State. The person is paying for transport and also paying for each bag of beans that they're bringing into the state. So now imagine bringing a bag of beans from, let's say, Kano State. Now from Kano State to Lagos, you have at least five states they're going to get through to come to Lagos State. So and they're, they're, they're experiencing um, the fact that they're going to pay at various checkpoints. For example, um, a particular um, lady that we met in the market that sells palm oils and sells um, granite oil, so she had, um, she brings her palm oil in from Enugu State, and she's coming from Enugu State. There are at least eight checkpoints that she's going she's to she pass through, pay. and she's paying at least five hundred naira per checkpoint. So, and this is included, and this all of this would have to factor. Yes, factor they have those. to factor it into their price. So mm. that was where our um, caption came from, because you know, <laughs> the shock. yeah. So <laughs> they're not really going to, uh, as as rational retailers that they are, they yeah. are going to have to pass the burden down, and the consumers would definitely, you know, bear the brunt of all of this additional costs that they are experiencing. All right, can you take us through the economics of price gouging? Yes, yeah, so um, price gouging in a sense is a situation where um, sellers or marketers in this case, you know, increase the price of their commodities so much so that the consumers find it unbearable and very unfair. However, this is not the case of what we're experiencing across markets, whether supermarkets or um, open markets in Lagos State. What we're experiencing is price discrimination which is a, nat a natural economic phenomenon that you know is a characteristic of imperfect markets and imperfect markets are very very much you know playing out right now in Lagos State and even in the country in general so this um Characteristics of um, you know price discrimination you know comes with imperfect markets imperfect markets where we have um, few um, um, sellers and many buyers where, where prices are not identical and you know there's also information asymmetry meaning that um, the, if there is no um, perfect information across markets regarding prices so that's why we can see that um, for this same particular commodity whether tomato or pepper. It, 
in surround markets, it could be it to be more expensive, and in um, in Oingbo markets to be less expensive. And then when we go to supermarkets, you see that even for supermarkets, price uh, of <laughs> staples are you know way yeah, higher absolutely. than than when you go to the market. So um, that's the um, concept behind um, what we did and the concept behind price, you know, disc and price discrimination. Right. In conclusion, of course, we've seen uh, the closure of Third Mainland uh, yes, Bridge. Yes. Do you see that increasing this price discrimination factor? Yeah, I mean, we, we had some um, retailers, you know, mention this because some um, retailers in Sura market, they, uh, they stay on the mainland. So, and sometimes, and a lot of times, they bring in their goods from the mainland to the island. So they're experiencing traffic congestion and, you know, to an extent, higher transport costs. So all of this, they factor into their prices. And this bridge closure is not, it's not for one month. We're looking at six months. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to factor all of this in, into, into their prices. And, you know, it's not just the um, bridge closure that's affecting the prices. We're looking at higher petrol, higher, um, petrol prices. Mm. Now, um, um, the price for petrol now is going for about is going for 148 naira um, per liter and this is going to be affect this is going to affect transportation costs for for um, you know bringing in their goods into um, the market and even out you know so all of this um, is definitely going to play out in the prices and um, you know continue to widen the price variation across markets. And this brings us to the some of the burning economic issues. Yes. Of course, we've seen Brent hovering around yes. the $44 uh, per barrel. So if we see uh, Brent perhaps going higher, so it's most likely Nigerians are going to pay more for, for fuel, right? Uh, yes. I mean, um, there's a positive correlation between um, the price of Brent and um, PMS price. Mm. So if PMS price goes up, so if um, Brent price goes up, PMS price is likely to go up, maybe by not the same um, um, degree, but it will definitely respond to that um, um, increase in, in Brent price. So if Brent price continues, the rally continues, you know, um, um, trading at $45 per barrel or even above $45 per barrel, we could see another increase in PMS price, probably up to 150 you know, naira per litre, or probably 155 if Brent reaches probably $55 per barrel. And consumers like us who want to buy some of those food commodities will have to exactly, pay for it. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, we have external results there, still yes. sliding down. Yes. Naira, well stable at the parallel market, but still 475 That also... Yes. Will enter, yes, yes. So for um, external reserves, actually there was a slight update this morning, and we saw that external reserves just inched up by about $10 million to to 35.63 um, billion dollars and you know this is a slight encouragement you know for the CBN because now they they have just a little more cash mm. to show up the Naira and keep it stable at what it is currently trading at but when we look at where the Naira is coming from and where it is now we have the Naira trading Naira was trading at about 360 um, Naira per dollar now it's about 475 you know Naira per dollar all of this would you know, affect imported inflation. When we look at supermarkets, they um, engage in commodities that have l longer Not, shelf life mm -hmm. and they import some of these commodities. commodities yeah. And this is an additional cost for them. So meaning that they are now buying these commodities at a more expensive rate. And then what we're going to see is they would revise their prices, which they've been, you know, engaging in for some time now because of um, all of the volatilities and market uncertainties. So that is also going to, you know, come into play and there will be an increase in imported inflation, which is a component of inflation. Interesting. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Dubebi, yes, <laughs> for thank time. You. Dubebi EK is one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. Well, we'll take a quick break and when we come back, we'll look at some of the issues of the foreign exchange market. Just stay with us. Nigeria has continued to grapple with shortage of foreign exchange supplies across the financial markets as demand outweighs supplies and rates overshoot their boundaries at the official investors and exporters window as well as the parallel market. While this trend has uh, prevented foreign portfolio investors from repatriating their sales proceeds, it has also held back prospective investors who would have returned to invest. To speak more on this is the head of portfolio management at Commercial Partners, Victor Aloui. Hello, Victor. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Morning. Thanks for having me. Now, between 
June 2017 and February 2020, foreign exchange was um, fairly stable with less volatility. But do we know what Nigeria's balance of payment looks like since March 2020 till date? Well, I think the um, foreign exchange situation um, has been under quite some pressure, um, you know, for the better part of this year. Um, if you look at the balance of payment position for Nigeria, uh, particularly data that was released for Q1 2020, uh, we saw the steepest decline uh, that we have seen since the first quarter of 2014. So essentially, balance of payment for Nigeria right now is a negative 11.1 billion. And that's coming from uh, about um, a positive 6.2 billion um, at the end of 2019 and uh, 2 billion in the first quarter of 2019. So clearly, the balance of payment position has been significantly stressed and it's all owing to uh, the whole COVID-19 challenge. It's also important to recall that, um, you know, just before COVID-19 hit, uh, the Nigerian economy was essentially on the mend and trying to recover from its first recession um, in about a quarter century. So uh, clearly a lot of stress points, particularly with respect to the um, uh, external position for Nigeria. Now, no doubt the turbulence has affected the economy largely, putting the external reserves under more pressure. How would you describe the strategic measures that the CBN has empl um, employed so far to manage uh, that market? Well, I think what the CBN has essentially continued to do is to try and protect, uh, you know, the precious reserves. Uh, for a bit of context, if you look at um, a year ago compared to uh, where the reserves are now, uh, reserves are down about $9.2 billion. Uh, we've seen a steady monthly decline in those reserves since uh, late last year. Uh, yet to date, reserves are down by about $2 billion. Uh, They were down about $5 billion, as a matter of fact, um, towards the end of um, April. However, the $3.5 billion that came through from the IMF sort of provided some support. So reserves have been um, under pressure. We are currently around $35 billion, uh, essentially about seven months of import cover. Um, you know, the CBN has continued to, uh, you know, ensure that those reserves are, you know, protected as much as uh, possible. We've seen adjustments um, in, in, the, in, the, in official rates. Uh, since March, uh, I'd say that we've had about a 24, almost 25 percent adjustment from, from about 305 to 360 and now to about 380. Uh, so clearly these are moves by the Apex Bank to sort of, um, you know, uh, properly align that market because in properly doing that, it can also sort of, um, you know, protect the nation's reserve position. Now, how has the OPEC plus production measures aided Nigeria's oil production and capital flows in this? Well, I, I think the oil, oh, um, the OPEC cut situation uh, doesn't exactly bode well for Nigeria, particularly over the next couple of months. Uh, you will recall that Nigeria was um, one of those uh, countries that had, um, you know, overshot its quota. And part of what, what OPEC had decided uh, when it decided to, uh, you know, reduce uh, those cuts from 9.7 to about 7.7 .7 was that for those countries that had um, overshot their quota, uh, Nigeria, Iraq, uh, you know, they were going to basically, you know, further reduce their own production to compensate uh, for the overproduction that they had uh, witnessed over the last couple of months. So right now, production for Nigeria is about 1.3 billion. Uh, so clearly that is going to have implications, um, you know, for revenue and also by extension on the FX situation. Also remember that, um, you know, in spite of the fact that crude oil has been on the ascendancy over the last couple of months, uh, we still remain easily 20% shy of where we were at the beginning of the year. But for the past two months, we've seen some kind of stability in the crude oil uh, price uh, hovering around $40 per barrel. Why hasn't um, this current price, why is it not a catalyst for foreign portfolio investors? Uh, well, for foreign portfolio investors, I think the key issue really is around... Um, dollar liquidity um for context right now you have about a five billion dollar backlog uh of um you know funds that are waiting to be repatriated particularly by foreign investors so clearly the liquidity situation uh is not very encouraging for a lot of foreign investors because for them if i'm bringing my money to invest i have to be uh, sure that whatever it is that i need to leave I can convert and also leave. But um, over the last couple of months, uh, they've not been able to do that. So that, that sends um, uh, some sort of signal that is not too comforting to, to foreign investors. So clearly, that has essentially um, kept them at bay. If, if you look at the 
sort of volume and value that we've seen, particularly on the Nigerian Stock Exchange over the last couple of months, you've seen that decline quite significantly. And that is also a reflection of the fact that um, a lot of these foreigners are unable to come into the market or do not want to come into the market because of that liquidity situation with the dollar. So what are your uh, foreign portfolio counterparts telling you about the unification of the foreign exchange rates by the CBN? I mean, it's a move in the right direction. Uh, clearly, there needs to be further adjustments even uh, from, you know, where we are currently. Yes, the CBN has made some adjustments so far. Uh, there still needs to be some further adjustments to, um, you know, clearly align and, you know, put that currency in, in the light of the reality of the situation. Also, liquidity is of the essence. Liquidity is extremely important. So for foreign investors, they need to be sure that, um, you know, whenever it is that they need to take their investments out, they, 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 they have that liquidity to do that. So uh, I think liquidity remains the biggest concern for um, a lot of the foreign investors. Now, some economies and um, past government officials have suggested that the CBN releases more FX uh, from the external reserves to the Bureau of the Change operators in order to manage the rates. Do you see that as a strategy that could create a difference? Well, I think what the CBN has essentially done is to try and take care of, um, you know, that iron in window segment of the markets. Um, for for the Apex Bank, um, a lot of the transactions that go on, particularly within the parallel market, um, are largely speculative and do not reflect, you know, real economic activity. Um, however, I think that, um, you know, the CBN, um, you know, apportioning dollars to that market would probably help. Nevertheless, uh, I don't know that the CBN has the luxury, particularly with the reserve position, uh, to, to actually continue to do that or to want to do that. So it's really a tough um, balancing act for the Apex Bank. But I think that that could help. But then again, how sustainable would that be, really? That, that's really the true question here. Now, the government is waiting for a $1.5 billion concessional loan from the World Bank. How much of impact is this fund likely to have on the backlogs of demand in the Forex market? Well, like I said earlier, we, we have a backlog of about uh, $5 billion. As a matter of fact, if you, if you do a deep dive into that reserve figure, we have um, close to um, $13 trillion worth of FX swaps that mature over the next one year thereabout um, for the next the remainder of this year, we have about seven billion worth of those FX swaps that mature. Um, you know, so all of that will still further put pressure, um, you know, on on the naira. Um, the the, the one point five billion um, was expected to have uh, come in by now. However, I think the board meeting of the IMF of the World Bank that was postponed uh, basically led to a delay of that. Also, mm -hmm. the World Bank expects even some further unification of the currency as a major precondition for the disbursement of that loan. Uh, we expect that uh, when the board reconvenes, uh, I think sometime in October, that loan should be dispersed. But $1.5 um, I don't know that it will make any significant impact. We got about 3.5 about a couple of months ago. Uh, we saw the impact that it made, uh, not so much. So $1.5 billion, particularly on the FX situation, uh, I'm not sure that the impact would be significant it's in the medium to long term. Hmm. And so for you, do you see a further adjustment to the exchange rate, perhaps before year end? I mean, I alluded to that, you know, in my earlier comments. I think that uh, we're likely to see uh, some further adjustments uh, from the Apex Bank. Uh, I think what the strategy is just to basically uh, continue to take it, uh, if you will, baby steps and gradually. But I think that you're, we're likely to see, you know, some further adjustment, at least before the year runs out, uh, the magnitude of which really remains to be seen. Now, have the various initiatives of the central bank, as the prohibition of FX for some items, the development of finance programs and the stimulus measures, all had any positive impact? Well, I think what all that has basically sought to do is to, you know, protect the reserves, really, and continue to give the Apex Bank, um, you know, ammunition, if you will, with which to continue to defend the Naira. Um, these are extraordinary measures in extraordinary times. Uh, really, for me, the issue is about and around the sustainability of these, of these measures. Uh, for how long can the Apex Bank continue to uh, sustain these measures and what the long-term impact on the nation's external position would be, really? So I think those are some of the uh, you know, major concerns. And what do you make of the priority now given to gold mining and the fact that the purchase will be in Naira? 
Well, I think it's all still part of the federal government's plan to essentially diversify, you know, the revenue base of the economy. Um, I don't expect any significant impact over the short term. Yes, there have been certain amendments to the laws now that make um, artisanal or alluvial mining illegal. Um, there, there, there's a framework now that ensures, um, you know, better investment into that sector. So obviously, we're likely to see even more revenues from there. But um, in the short to medium term, uh, that impact would not be significant. Uh, stuff like this actually needs time and certainly does take time to, to work and for us to see the impact. So in the, in the near to medium term, I think that the impact is um, not going to be significant. But of course, over, over a long term period, we're likely mm. to see the gains from, from that move. And what can you tell us about the performance of Nigeria's Eurobond securities today? Well, so Nigerian Eurobonds has basically been risk on um, over the last, um, you know, week plus thereabouts. Essentially, Eurobond yields across the Nigerian curve are basically back to their, pretty much back to their pre-COVID levels. So it speaks um, volumes uh, as regards uh, the risk sentiment around Nigeria. It's also important to note that um, with the ultra-loose monetary policy that's going on around the globe right now, uh, there's plenty of cash essentially looking for yield. Uh, with the continuous decline in um, U.S. Treasury yields, uh, you would obviously see, um, you know, monies looking for better yield people elsewhere in names that have decent credit quality. And I think that's what we're, what we've seen um, on the Nigerian curve. Uh, however, I expect to see some sort of profit taking over the next, uh, you know, couple of days on that curve. All right. Thanks, um, Victor, for your time. Victor, I'll thank you for having is the head of portfolio management at Commercial Partners. All for a quick review of Wednesday's equities trading and, of course, outlook. We have Eddie Dion Erwan here. Eddie, good morning. Well, we saw a reversal yesterday. Hmm? Good morning, Timmy. Yeah, the market's reversed a negative trend we've seen since the beginning of the week yesterday due to um, buying interest in Etel Africa and Seplas. Now, because of those gains, the All Share Index rose by 1% to 25,141.48 points. Now, that brought the month to date gain to one plus 1.8%, while the year to day loss moderated to minus 6%. The total volume of trade declined by 0.8% yesterday to 204.88 million units valued at 3.83 billion naira and all of that was exchanged in 3,636 deals. Now, GT Bank was the most traded stock by volume and value, respectively at 66.25 million units and 1.65 billion naira, respectively. Now, looking at the sector charts, we see that oil and gas gained the most by 5.2%. Insurance was up 0.6%, while consumer goods rose 0.2%. On the other hand, banking index declined by 0.4%, and industrial goods also declined. Now, market sentiment, as measured by market breadth, was positive. We saw 18 gainers as against 10 losers. But on the phone now to talk more about the market is Jamil Kayode, a stock broker at APT Securities and Funds. Good morning, Mr. Kayode. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So yesterday we saw increased buying interest on Etel Africa, which also, you know, rose the, which added to the gains we saw in the market yesterday. What is attracting investors to Etel Africa? Thank you very much. Um, um, the Etel Africa, what may when you look at their results, um, they release um, and the the auditor report of uh, Etel Africa. It's a very good result, and they have increased uh, uh, both in their top line and the bottom line, and also declared dividends for the period. And if you look at the half-year results, also is very impressive. And uh, but most importantly, the uh, head that Hertel Africa has over other stocks uh, uh, for the for the fact that you can trade. Uh, Hertel Africa, both in Nigerian stock exchange and also the other stock exchange mm -hmm. at the same time. So this is what uh, the reason why um, investors are very comfortable uh, having uh, uh, um, um, Hertel Africa in their portfolio. And that's the reason why you see it at any point in time, uh, investors are ready to go for it at any price that is currently trading right now. I'm so glad. What would you attribute the declines we saw in the banking and industrial goods sector to yesterday? 
Um, in uh, industrial goods sector and uh, uh, banking, you know, uh, um, during the reason why they are declining, uh, declining is that um, we have had them going uh, growing up uh, um, in the last two weeks. You see the, the, the new interest in the banking sector and also uh, in the banking sector particularly. So in this sector, you see a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, um, 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 profit taking. And that is why you see that uh, you see that the banking uh, stocks are, are a bit uh, coming down. But if you look at uh, uh, um, the second uh, index you made mention of, is uh, Boa that was really responsible for that. You know, Boa is, is the third largest, uh, the most capitalized stock on the floor of Nigerian stock exchange. So anything that happened to Boa, whether uh, um, it has an increment in the price or increments in the price, you realize that this, the prices in that sector will always be on the negative side or whichever side the, that, that uh, Boa has, uh, whichever direction that Boa moves, uh, moves. So this is what happened yesterday. You see Boa losing around uh, um, two point something percent yesterday. So that is why you see them, uh, the, the index in that uh, corridor is moving in that direction too. Well, Mohammed, just before I let you go, could you give us your outlook for today? Today's outlook, uh, I expect that the market should be on the uh, um, negative territory, though it's going to be a minimal, it's going to close on the marginal uh, side because of the fact that you see, as it is, as we are having it as it is now, we saw the market uh, losing about 0.6%, uh, and it was as a result of, um, it's as a result of a boa losing about 1.8% uh, as it is currently. Though, I expect that some other stuff can be a signal to the market to make it uh, to have a kind of a balance uh, closing at the end of the day. But all in the all is the same. The market is likely to close marginally, and we expect the market to continue the bullish run the, uh, the week coming. But as it is right now, the market may close uh, marginally at the end of the day. All right, Mr. Jamil Mohammed. Thank you for input on the program. Jamil Mohammed is a stockbroker at APT Securities and Fund. Well, Chimeze, we'll have to leave it there for a moment. Over to you. All right, thanks, Eddie. We'll keep our fingers crossed and see how the market ends today. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll do a crossover to London and, of course, back to you for the debt and currency market report. All right, let's get update from the streets of London with Juliana Olayinka. Good morning, Juliana. It's the morning after the release of the GDP numbers. What other feelers are you getting on this, either from the government or from the business community? Uh, good morning, Chibuse. Well, I think everything that was said was says, said yesterday, but the dust has settled, and unlike... Uh, yesterday's groundbreaking figures um, on the FTSE all share. Uh, this morning it's opened up in negative territory. I think that the dust has settled really and now traders are looking at the economic woes that are lying ahead in Britain. And of course there are talks about that second wave of infection or as some people like to say, the same wave, just an increase in infection. Uh, yesterday what um, was certified is that in three months, over a decade and a half of growth was wiped out of the British economy, which is absolutely uh, staggering. We had that uh, fall of 20.4% of GDP in Q2, and we realise that we are the worst performing uh, country when it comes to GDP in the entirety of Europe. Now, I know a lot of economists have been racking their brain, and it appears to be the fact that we just went so late into lockdown, and of course we are almost still in lockdown. Non-essential stores in Germany were opened after 50 days. Here in Britain, non-essential stores opened after 83 days. So you can imagine how much was lost in those 33 days. I've got to say, um, even though we weren't so sure yesterday, there does appear to be some hopes of a V-shaped economy. It's a shame that our viewers can't see a graph, but if you look at the uptick, it certainly is showing that potentially Britain's economy could be on the rise again. I believe in April, the fall was just about 20% of growth. In May, we saw growth return for about 2.2%. And in June, we saw growth of 8.7%.
there are expectations that in July and August, August in particular because of that Eat Out to Help Out scheme, uh, that growth will be uh, much larger. So a lot of hopes now are on the fact that even though we are in the deepest recession in Europe, it could be the shortest recession uh, because EY Item Club have uh, Britain's uh, GDP in Q3 at about a 17% um, rise. So uh, who knows? <laughs> we'll continue to watch and see. All right, the National Grid has fired up a coal-fired power station for the first time in 55 um, days. What will this mean for Britons? Well, um, I'm not certain what it means uh, for Britons, but uh, for um, the, the energy sector here in the UK, it will keep uh, pumping again. It's actually been really hot here in Britain over the past week across swathes of the country, I believe in Heathrow, uh, which is uh, the, the place that uh, meteorologists or weather experts look to see the weather. I think temperatures were hitting above 37 degrees. And here in Britain, that's pretty rare, especially as it was consistent. And because of this, a lot of uh, the places where we get energy, uh, that they were becoming faulty because they rely on air pressure to keep them pumping. That's what I um, have read. And so to help um, assist that, uh, the government have decided to pump um, their coal um, power stations again. Uh, we haven't been using coal, as you said, for 55 days. I believe that's the longest stretch since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Britain and uh, Boris Johnson's Conservative government are trying to put themselves at the forefront of uh, energy um, climate emergency and trying to reduce how many fossil fuels uh, they burn. And so this is what they had to do. The heat was too much. They had to rely on coal. So it's the first time mm. in 55 days. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson is poised to sign off new rules barring the UK government's chief foreign lender from offering financial support to foreign fossil fuel projects. Tell us more about this. Well, it's a similar story to what we were just discussing. Um, and it really started at the beginning of the year um, in Boris Johnson's first international summit, he hosted a wealth of African leaders, including the Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari, uh, for the UK Africa Investment Summit. And in his speech, he did say uh, that uh, the British government will no longer be using taxpayers' money uh, to fund any um, fossil fuel burning projects, particularly the use of coal. They just don't think it's right that as Britain and the West, the global North, are reducing their reliance on coal, that they'll be funding projects that uh, are coal heavy. Uh, so now the legislation has been put in place and it's not just coal, it's other fossil fuels. And really it's about the money that comes from the UK export finance. There are a lot of um, uh, uh, climate groups that have been looking at just how much money Britain is putting into funding what they consider to be dirty uh, businesses. And apparently, since Britain signed the Paris Climate Agreement, I believe it was in 2015, they've spent £3.5 billion in funding these dirty industries. And so the British government say that they're not going to do that anymore, or that at least they're going to be reducing the amount uh, that they uh, put into funding uh, these fuels just so that they can meet their climate goal objective which I believe is to reduce that by 2050. Well, Juliana, we'll wait for more updates from you later in the day. And back here on the debt and currency market. Eddie, back to you. Thank you, Chimezie. Well, the Nigerian Treasury bills market was flat yesterday as investors paid attention to the primary market auction where the CBN rolled over maturing bills worth 56.78 billion naira with allotment of 19.78 billion naira on the 91-day maturity, 10 billion naira on the 182-day maturity, and 27 billion naira on the 34. 364-day maturity at respective stop rates of 1.20%, 1.39%, and 3.12%. The OMO market, on the other hand, was bullish as averages contracted by five basis points. At the bond market, that market was also bullish yesterday as average yields contracted by eight basis points. Now, across the curve, we saw yields expanding at the short end while yields contracted at the mid end of the curve. But to talk a bit more about the foreign exchange market is Ajiket Taiwo, an FX trader at FSDH Merchant Bank. Good morning, Ajiket. Thank you for joining us on the program. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. 
So yesterday we saw um, the Naira decline against the dollar at the I&E window. Could you just describe how volume of transactions have been in that space this week? Um, this week we've seen a dip in the volume of transactions in that market. Um, mostly because we've been in the middle of a global pandemic, so we've seen peaks and dips in that market. And this week we've seen a dip. What is your outlook for the fixing, um, the foreign exchange market today and on Friday? Um, I don't expect to see anything different from what we've currently been seeing. Um, most of the parameters are still the same. And yes. All right, Ajika, thank you for your input on the program. Ajika Taiwo is a foreign exchange dealer at FSDH Merchant Bank. Well, that is on the market review. We we'll hope for a better trading day today. Over to you, Jimmy. Well, let's just um, hope so, Eddie. All right, just before we round off, um, let's uh, take a quick look again at the global oil market as uh, uh, prices eased slightly this morning, but held most of their gains from the previous session after U.S. government data showed a fall in inventories, supporting the view that fuel demand is returning despite the coronavirus pandemic. Brent crude was down $0.08 cents at $45.35 a barrel after a gain of around 2% in the previous session. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down by $0.06 cents at $42.61 a barrel after gaining 2.6% on Wednesday. US U.S. crude oil, gasoline and distillate inventories fell last week as refiners ramped up production and demand improved. Data from the Energy Information Administration showed U.S. fuel demand rose to 19.37 million barrels per day last week, the highest since March, while crude output fell to 10.7 million barrels per day from 11 million barrels per day. Crude inventories fell by 4.5 million barrels compared with analyst expectations. The EIA's downward revision on Tuesday to a key U.S. oil production forecast for this year also supported prices. U.S. crude production is forecast to fall by 990,000 barrels per day this year to 11.26 million barrels per day, steeper than the 600,000 barrels per day decline it forecast last month. Capping gains, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries said in a monthly report that world oil demand will fall by 9.2 Zero six million barrels per day this year, more than the 8.95 million barrels per day decline expected a month ago. Analysts say increasing uncertainty over a stalemate in Washington on a stimulus package to support recovery from the deepest impact of the coronavirus pandemic may also weigh on prices. Well, that's a wrap on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago.